I'm not really an academic. I uh, went to law school and I've been a PR person for a long time. Did my first press conference in 1972. So long, long time ago. And in my country, I have a reputation for being the guy that you would call if you get yourself into trouble of some sort, reputational problems, so kind of crisis and issues stuff. And I, um, as I've gotten older and, you know, earned the money to allow me to kind of think a little differently, I've come to the conclusion that there's too much PR in the world. Uh, a lot too much. And I think that's particularly true of um, the uh, climate change issue. And the, about six or seven years ago, I started to, I was redoing my website. And somebody said, you know, you should have a community service part to the website. We should do something about climate change, because everybody seems to be so kind of confused about, you know, is it real? And you think about this was before Inconvenient Truth. This was back in the days where there was this kind of raging debate in the news media about whether or not it's even happening. Right? Much more so than anything you see today. And so I thought, well, that's a good idea. So then I had to, because it was going to be on my website, I had to actually start reading about climate change. So I started reading, you know, the Royal Society and the National Academy of Sciences and, you know, people you know, that you would think that, oh, well, I guess I would trust them. You know, if the Royal Society is saying this, then that's fairly reliable, you know, you would think. Uh, and then I started looking at the other side and I thought, wow, this is really interesting. This is like tobacco-like stuff. And, uh, you know, this is my business, right? And then I started watching these climate scientists wander innocently onto a television set and get beaten up by uh, a climate change denier. Uh, and so I thought, this is very odd, you know, because what's happening is these climate scientists seem to be kind of uh, helping the um, deliver the message that there's a debate by debating. I understand why they're doing it, but it seems like sort of an odd result that they're getting. And in my business, we think a lot about framing. We don't think about it in a theoretical way. We think about it in a sort of a day-to-day, -day how do we respond to something? And you don't like to you know, be drawn into somebody else's frame. You want to have your own point of view. And so I thought, you know, I was looking at this and I thought, this is really bad. And the more I read, the more I thought, this is a really, this is actually quite a terrible situation because the amount of misinformation that's being propagated here is really changing the way the media is kind of setting or not setting the agenda on this issue. And so I started to see how it was actually being sort of nudged away from any kind of serious public policy on it. And I thought, you know, I picked up this book, it was written by uh, a, a guy from Boston named Ro Ross Gelpspan. And he, the book was called Boiling Point. And he, so I read it and I thought, I've got to go see this guy. So I went down to Boston, talked to Ross, and he said, you know, this is an old story. I think this story's been told. And I said, geez, Ross, you know, I think you kind of hang around with the same people too much because I don't think anybody knows about this. You know, certainly it was a surprise to me and I'm like one of these guys you, you wrote about in your book. And so I thought, I'd been reading it in Fortune magazine about blogs, and this was very early in the blog, uh, the history of, recent history of blogs, so I thought, we should start a blog. So I handed this book to a friend of mine. I was actually, sadly, in his jet flying to Europe. So I said, I was reading Ross's book, uh, this chapter on deniers again, and I handed it to this guy. And he's a lawyer, and he you know, has a kind of a sense of this stuff, and he got really angry. And I got angry, and we said, okay, well, let's do this. And so he put a whole bunch of money into it, and we hired some people. And the first meeting, he said, the first one of you guys, and these are writers, right? The first one of you guys who gets a statement of claim slapped on us gets a $5,000 bonus. <laughs> and so we started out, like, really aggressively, and he has a lot of money. And so we weren't afraid of lawsuits, and, you know, I'm a lawyer, he's a lawyer, the bunch of us were lawyers, so we decided we'd be really aggressive with this. Um, so we started Desmog Blog, and then I ended up writing this book. 
And it's based on three questions. <clears throat> if you're disagreeing with the National Academy of Sciences, you know, are you actually a climate scientist? Have you done climate science? Are you being paid by, or who's funding you? So we just ask these questions over and over and over again of all these climate change skeptics. I don't like that word any more than I like the word deniers, but it's hard to figure out exactly what to call these folks. Uh, but we just kept asking these questions, and what I found, and I'm not a scientist, social scientist, or a climate scientist, but I do know a lot about PR. And what we found over and over and over again, this was all about PR, it's not about science. There wasn't really a debate that was going on in science. There was a debate, but not a debate in science. Anyway, so I wrote this book and uh, did a book tour. And I was kind of shocked at the response that I got. And what I realized after it settled in, after this was a couple of years ago that this came out, it was very well received. Um, but I realized that I, th that I got it wrong that I didn't quite have the whole story, you know, partly because of what Dan is talking about and some of the other things other folks have been speaking about here, um, that I was really looking at just a very narrow sliver of this, of this problem. And people didn't ask questions of me like, you know, tell me more about how evil Exxon is. Uh, they, they were kind of shocked at just how extensive this is because it's far worse than what you imagine. I mean, the, I've been doing looking at this for about six years or seven years. It's way worse and it's got to do with a lot more than just climate change. Um, but people wanted to know what you do about it. And, and they asked questions about motivation, like do these people know they're lying, you know? Do they, I mean, what, what how do they sleep at night, you know? They, you know, how is it possible that one group with all the facts on their side can lose a debate to another group with no facts on their side? Kind of shocking, you know, it's puzzling. And, and so I, you know, most of the questions that I was asked, I didn't really feel like I could answer. So I decided to write another book. And uh, this book is called Duped and How. And I started, I thought, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around and ask that question about what do you do about this to people. And actually, I interviewed Dan, so I'm really happy to, to see him here and meet up with him again. And I interviewed people like Peter Senge. I'm just part of the way into the book. Uh, I've interviewed uh, uh, Daniel Yankelovich, um, Stuart Yoon, who's a really interesting guy who's a kind of a historian of public relations and propaganda. Uh, Lakoff, and I also interviewed, I, I thought, it's not just a social science question, it's also a spiritual question. And so I started inter interviewing spiritual leaders, and two people that I spoke to were the Dalai Lama and um, Thich Nhat Hanh. And so I've been asked to just tell you what they said. Uh, because I, I find this thing personally really puzzling, so I, I'm, I'm not here to sort of say, you know, this is it, you really need to pay attention to this. I see this as a problem, you know, we're continuing to push on this. We were just all over the New York Times this morning with uh, some exposure work that we were doing on um, um, the Heartland Institute. I mean, my, my theory is just a very simple theory because I'm the guy who has to actually do stuff. You know, I'm the communications guy, so I actually have to make decisions about how you communicate. I can't just think about it, right? And so I, you know, I, I thought, okay, turn on the lights, the critters go back, scuttle back into the corners, right? That's the whole kind of strategy behind this. But clearly it's not enough. And it's also kind of like an unpleasant area. You know, you don't really like to talk about it. People don't like to think this way or be this way. You know, it's kind of nasty in a way. You know, I don't particularly like it myself, but I sort of feel I have a responsibility to point this out to folks. So. When I asked this question to Thich Nhat Hanh, I don't know how many of you know him, but he's a very well-known Buddhist uh, teacher, Vietnamese a Zen Buddhist monk, and he was in Vancouver, so I interviewed him and David Suzuki. And I asked him this, this question about climate change denial and this whole collective awakening. You know, how do, we, how do we bring about the collective awakening that seems to be needed to make this shift? 
And he said, uh, uh, people already know that the planet is being destroyed. That uh, the real problem is not that you need to talk to them about it more. The real problem is that people have a vacuum uh, and, and pain inside and suffering inside, and they don't know how to handle it. That. Um, and that people try to cover up suffering and this vacuum by consuming. And that in his view, this is the tragedy of our time. It's not that people don't know, they know. Um, they just feel helpless about what it is they should be uh, um, doing to sort of handle this feeling of helplessness. And he said, uh, he then started talking about despair. And he said that, um, uh, that you have to start by accepting the, that you have to start by accepting uh, the fact that we could actually destroy civilization as we know it. He said that if we allow uh, despair to take over, then we don't have any strength. And so then he started to talk about, um, he said the two ways to deal with despair, in his mind, were through meditation. And he called meditation kind of thinking deeply. Um, and that that's a way of kind of, uh, that meditation is a way of dealing with despair. And then he talked about community. And that he said that, you know, our world needs healing. And in community, uh, you will find healing. If you can live in a community where people can show you that living a simple life can make you happy, uh, that that will go a long way towards this healing and dealing with this feeling of despair. Uh, anyway, so he, he talked about this despair problem quite a bit. We, there's an hour long, if you Google David Suzuki, Thich Nhat Hanh, you'll see the conversation about this, it's worthwhile looking at. Anyway, so then I got back to my question because I started thinking like, is he saying let's just go meditate, you know, and then take care of the problem, right? Didn't seem to, it didn't fit with, with me very well, you know, so I said, look, at the David Suzuki Foundation, we have to be advocates. Are you suggesting that we're not, that we don't do that? And then he looked at me, but actually it's more like looked through me, you know, this guy's an extremely powerful man. And he said, speak the truth, but not to punish. And, you know, I don't know how many of you, you know, what kind of an effect that has on you, uh, but any of you who feel the kind of anger that I do from day to day when I have to deal with some of the nonsense from these people that we write about on this blog, that really meant a lot to me, you know? And so now I'm trying to shift to just let the facts speak for themselves. Anyway, very quickly, because I know I'm going to get the uh, shepherd hook here in a minute. So I also had the chance to go to Dharamsala at, to the uh, Mind Life uh, conference uh, that the Dalai Lama puts on every year just a few months back. And I asked him, uh, I said, uh, I said, it's really unusual. Uh, you know, first I asked him whether or not it was true what WikiLeaks said about him that he had said publicly that uh, perhaps it's a time that we can set aside the Tibet-Beijing problem and that the leading countries in the world should be focusing on the impact of climate change on the Tibetan plateau. I asked him if he said that because it sounded kind of surprising to me. And he said, no, he did. And he said the reason is because the politics will change when they, when it, when they change. But these environmental impacts, especially on the great rivers of Tibet, the Brahmaputra, and all these great rivers of Tibet, is going to be permanent. Some of this is going to be irreversible, and he's very concerned about it. So I asked him, I said, OK, so you have been the subject of propaganda for uh, most of your life. But it's unusual, because people don't believe the propaganda. Uh, they believe you. So do you have any advice for climate scientists who are being subjected to this propaganda? 
And he said, uh, I, I was worried that he didn't understand it, actually. And then I started reviewing the tape that I'd done. And I realized, no, he understood my question quite well. And he said, he, he, he said something like this, completely different. He said, he said, in a totalitarian government, when they, when they say that I'm a demon, people in the West who live in free societies look at it and they don't believe it. You know, they know it's from a totalitarian government. But in the West, when you see propaganda, maybe not so easy to see it. And he said, you have a bad habit in the West that you want everything to happen immediately. He said, in Tibet, we have a saying that says, if you fail, you try harder. If you fail again, you try harder. Nine times fail, nine times try harder. You just keep going. And that ultimately, um, I th he said, I've been t talking about the power of compassion most of my life. 40 years I've been talking about compassion. I only now I'm starting to see that there is actually starting to have some effect and that there are some things that are starting to change. People are starting to understand it. So you really need to be more persistent. And then he went right to the basics and he said, um, what, what climate scientists should do is take the science, simplify it, and talk about it over and over and over and over again and not worry about whether or not anyone's listening because eventually people will listen. And to me, you know, as a PR guy, I, well, I, you know, I almost every day tell a client that you know, good public communications is about three things. Compelling messages repeated frequently from trusted sources. It's a very sort of simple formula. And I've always thought that where we lose is on the repetition part because we believe in reason. You know, that, well, didn't I already say that? It's like Ross Gelbspan, right? That's kind of, that's already been told. That part of the story has already been told. And so I think that what the Dalai Lama is saying is very sort of basic kind of advice that, you know, we really need to do. It, it's not complicated, in my view. As, it, it's not as complicated as what I'm hearing here. I think we don't even do the basics very well. You know, we get beat on repetition all the time. And so I think essentially what he's saying is, you know, public education is essentially a process of uh, repetition. So, thank you. Thank you, Jim.